question um, to start off. A question up here. So the question is this. Which enumerated power in Article 1, Section 8 did Chief Justice Marshall rely on in McCulloch, Maryland to uphold the Bank of the United States? A, Commerce Clause, B, ne a Taxing Power, C, Necessary and Proper, or D, all the above? It's almost silly doing a poll with four people, but I'll stick with it. I have to go to the uh, AT&T store to get the Okay. But over the weekend. Okay. Okay. Then if you just want to email me, I'll, I'll mark you present later. Oh, yeah. I think it, it does, like, check them, but it might have, like, the poll. I see. Okay. That's fine. I'll check. I'll check. All right. All right, so here's your quiz. All right, doesn't count. Okay. All right, Faven, what do you think? I put C. Okay, why do you put C? I put C because um, I know the comments, I was deciding between A and C, and I know A is about um, among and the definition of commerce, so necessary and proper just made more sense mm -hmm. in terms of the quick way to get there. All right, Chelsea, what do you think? Oh, what do you think? Um, I put C as well. Oh. Yeah. I guess mainly just because it's talking about McCullough versus Maryland to uphold the bank. And even though the Commerce Clause and the Necessary Proper Clause are kind of linked together. Ah, linkage. So, so let me let me let me push in that a little bit. What does that mean? They're linked. Give me, t tell me what that actually means. I think you're you're you're, you're getting to where, where I want to go. Right, so, so here we go. It says Article 1, Section 8. Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying to execution the foregoing powers. Which includes the Commerce Clause. Exactly. I think that's how you mentioned it. Yeah, and I like the way she put it linkage, right? This is something that most law students never understand. Um, in every single case you read involving federal power, you always have to ask, what is the starting point, right? What is the foregoing power that Congress is looking to? And it's almost always the Commerce Clause, uh, but it might be also the taxing power. Once you know what the foregoing power is, then you can then look to the necessary and proper to provide additional authority, right? To enact a law to carry into execution. In other words, to actually do the regulation of commerce or to do the laying of taxes. So the necessary and proper clause provides an additional um, basis of power. So the answer here is C. You guys all, you, know, you're, you, all, you all, I think, got it right. Uh, one, one, I've never had 100% before. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> good job. Um, but always when I do this quiz in, in a larger class, people want to put A, people want to put D, right? And I always get a lot of people putting D all the above in this question. And the reason why they put D is they think, oh, they're linked, right? They're linked. They're all together. But that's not actually what Marshall held. He didn't say that the Commerce Clause as an independent basis is enough. It's the Necessary and Proper Clause by itself. Does that make sense, everybody? All right. Um, this topic of implied powers uh, we'll be on for the next three or four classes. And in every case, I will ask you the same question. Um, where does Congress get the power to do X? To you know, prohibit sugar monopolies or ban lottery tickets, wh whatever, the, whatever the thing is, right? Where does Congress get the power to do X? And on a class recitation or on an exam, you got to give me a clause. And I'll give you the answer to the exam right now. The answer is almost always necessary and proper. Uh, that's almost always going to be the answer. But that's not going to be enough. That's too easy. 
Uh, the answer would be why or how does a necessary and proper clause provide the requisite authority? Right? That, that, that's where questions get a little bit more um, tricky. OK? Make sense? OK, very good. All right, so we have several cases today that must seem like they have absolutely nothing in common, right? There, there's not really any sort of like theme or co common facts. We have first Prig v. Pennsylvania, which involves a fugitive slave clause. And then you have a case from, uh, you have DeWitt, which involves banning oil, the sale of oil. Then you have Hepburn and, and, and Knox, which involves paper money. Then you have um, E.C. Knight, which involves a sugar monopoly. And then you have Champion v. Ames, which involves banning lottery tickets. Uh, then you have Hammer versus Dagenhart, which is child labor. Uh, these are cases decided over the course of almost, what, about 90 years or so, almost 100 years, um, on a wide range of topics. And this class is basically um, a bridge, right? Last class, we did the Marshall Court. And starting the next class, we'll do what we often call the New Deal Court in the 1930s and 40s. This is all that stuff in between, where you can actually see um, the fluctuation of powers over the years. And I think I showed you this video in the class last year. And you can watch it at home, but I'll just show you the, the timeline for a moment, um, just to give you a sense of, of, of where of where we are. There we go. OK? This is a timeline at a big level. So you have Washington, you have Marshall, you have Tawney, you have Chase, you have the progressive here. You see it sort of fluctuates up and down. So students often have difficulty figuring out, you know, where are we? What are we doing at a given point in time? And this class helps to bridge that gap. So any questions before we get started? Very good. 100% of the quiz. I've never had 100 before. Always one straggler, uh, but works out here. All right. So let's start with Prig. Um, and let me give you a little bit of uh, a little bit of, of background first, which we covered in the first class. Um, in the Constitutional Convention of 1787, um, slavery was a huge issue, but they didn't actually say it. And that all these different ways of talking about slavery without actually using the word slaves. And that was deliberate. They, they, there was a, a genuine belief at the time that um, slavery would not endure. Right, that the institution, for one reason or another, would end. And they didn't want to put in writing that word. There was also the fear that if they didn't ratify in this sort of circumspect way, they wouldn't be able to have a, con a country at all. They wouldn't have a ratified constitution. So the framers settled on this provision in Article 4, Section 2. It's called the Fugitive Slave Clause. Okay, do not confuse the Fugitive Slave Clause with the Fugitive Slave Act. S students get them confused all the time. I'm embarrassed. In our book, we actually confused it. I fixed it in this spot, but we screwed it up. So don't confuse them. I did. Um, the Fugitive Slave Clause is part of Article 4, and it says, no person held to service or labor in one state. Okay, that means a slave. They're not saying it means a slave. So that means, if you, let's say you're a slave in Maryland, under the laws of Maryland, and you escape, that means you travel, right? But they consider it an escape. You escape into another state. Okay, what happens? Shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, that means based on the laws of Maryland, the slave state, blah, 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 be delivered, that means returned, up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. That's referring to the master, the owner, right? This is basically describing what happens if there's a slave who runs away, or in our case, who leaves with permission, which often happened. But I want to just focus on the text here. This provision describes um, the relationship between state A and state B, Maryland and Pennsylvania. Right? In fact, if you look at Article 4 in the Constitution, these are all provisions involving the relations between the states. We have the Privileges and Immunities Clause, right? full faith and credit, all that stuff is there. What this basically says is, 
hey, Pennsylvania, you may not allow slavery in your borders, but if the laws of another state require the return, then you are bound to oblige. Okay? But what if they don't? What if Pennsylvania says, screw you, uh, we're not going to comply with this law? Now, Pennsylvania didn't quite go so far as saying, screw you, but they enacted a specific law called the Personal Liberty Law. And a number of states adopted these, but they were most um, significant in the border states, because Pennsylvania's here and Maryland's here, they're, they're right in the border, right? And what these personal liberty laws did was they imposed um, barriers to the return of a slave from one state to another. And specifically in the Pennsylvania law, they required going to court, right? That the owner or his representative, the slave catcher, and when I see the movie 12 Years a Slave, it's about, yeah, it's a, it's a hard movie to watch, but it, it describes the slave catching. It's, 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 a, it's an awful movie, um, but it, it, it's, it's brutally accurate. Um, under the Pennsylvania law, the slave catcher has to go to a court in Pennsylvania and actually provide some evidence about who the person is they're seeking and ownership information. And this affords the judge an opportunity to decide, is this actually the person I'm looking for, or maybe it's a mistaken identity. It happened very often that they got the wrong person, or they didn't care to say, oh yeah, that's, that's John Smith, he's, 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 he's coming back with me. And there's no, no, no process. So Pennsylvania built in what's effectively a judicial process to ensure that people were not um, seized who were not supposed to be seized. Um, is that law, is the Pennsylvania Liberty Law consistent with the Fugitive Slave Clause? I didn't say act, right? Is the Pennsylvania Law consistent with this, with Article 4? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. The Constitution is pretty silent on what shall be delivered means, on the claim of the party. I mean, can a state erect a process by which these claims are processed? Maybe, maybe not. So you can see how the language here gives a lot of um, uh, uh, leeway to the states and how they actually manage the, the, the relations between state A and state B. Congress, however, uh, wasn't willing to let uh, this sort of arrangement be uh, so open-ended. Instead, Congress enacted the Fugitive Slave Act in 1793. So this is barely four years after the Constitution was ratified. Congress enacts the Fugitive Slave Act. And what this law basically says is that you can't have these additional processes before a slave is returned. In other words, it says we are enacting a federal law that suppress, I'm sorry, not suppress, I'm sorry, preempts a federal law that preempts any state law to the contrary. Okay, make sense? All right, so that's the background. And the Future Slave Act was in effect for, you know, three or four decades at this point. And then Pennsylvania comes along and enacts their personal liberty law. All right, that brings us to the facts. Uh, Tyler, you want to give us the facts of actually how Prig and who Prig was and how the case actually got started? not guilty to the charges of the alleged assault. I think it was basically 
kidnapping. Bingo. And who's he kidnapping? Margaret Morgan, yeah. Into yeah, exactly. So the facts of this case are, um, the facts of this case prove why the Pennsylvania law was a good idea as a matter of policy, right? So you had Margaret Morgan, right? She was living in Maryland as a slave. And then her owner, a guy named John Ashmore, um, allowed her to leave. Uh, you were allowed to emancipate your slave. That was perfectly lawful. There was nothing, nothing wrong with that. You were allowed to. And she went to Pennsylvania to get married and had some kids here. And I hear well, in Pennsylvania. Um, but then a couple years later, after John Ashmore dies, the widow comes along and says, uh-uh-uh, you're coming back. And so it's actually the widow. She sent Prig, who was the catcher, I use the word catcher, it's kidnapper, right? That, that's basically the word, it's a false imprisonment. But he sent Prig over the border to arrest Morgan. Right, if I send one of you as my agent to go to Oklahoma and bring someone back, you can be arrested, right? It's a kidnapping, it's a crime. You can't falsely imprison a person, drag them across state lines, it's, you, can't, you can't do that. So Pennsylvania says, okay, come to our court, right? Show us evidence, and he's like, not gonna do it. So then Pennsylvania charges Prig with kidnapping, right? That's why it's Prig versus Pennsylvania. It's a criminal case, right? Prig is charged with kidnapping. Now, unfortunately, Miss Morgan did get sent back, right, uh, to, to Maryland. Uh, but the governor of Maryland allowed Prig to be extradited back to Pennsylvania to be tried. So what was Prig's defense, right? He did it. He was guilty, right? He, he, he committed a kidnap. He violated state law. There's no question. So he's not going to say, you know, I didn't have the mens rea. It wasn't me, the wrong guy. He did it. Instead, Faven, what was Prig's defense, right? How did Prig defend himself in this case? So um, he argued that under the supremacy clause, the federal fugitive state act preempted the state personal liberty law. Perfect answer, right? Perfect answer. He says that under the supremacy clause, Federal law supreme. And as a result, the Pennsylvania kidnapping statute is not unconstitutional, but when there's a conflict between the Pennsylvania kidnapping, the liberty statute, right, and the federal, um, uh, the, the federal uh, Fugitive Slave Act, when there's a conflict, we know it wins. So the entire case then turns on whether the Fugitive Slave Act was a valid exercise of federal power. Again, this was not like a modern day case where, a, where someone goes to court and asserts that this um, statute is unconstitutional and seeks like an injunction to block it. The way back then stuff got to court was in criminal prosecutions. Right, think of McCulloch, right? He was prosecuted for not paying the damn fine. And so he said, uh-uh, this Maryland law is unconstitutional, it's preempted. Um, even Gibbons, right? They, they, it wasn't a criminal bill, it was a civil proceeding to shut down his ferry operation. Like, no, 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 my ferry operation's fine because of this federal law. Again, in Prig, it's the same damn thing, right? They're saying, you cannot enforce this Pennsylvania liberty law, this kidnapping statute against me because federal law trumps. Okay, everyone with me so far? All right, so the majority opinion in this case is written by Justice Story. Uh, you've probably have you heard of Justice Story? He was one of the greatest justices of the 19th century. Um, he was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court at the age of 33 by James Madison. You want to feel slackery, right? Uh, uh, he, he, he was also a professor at Harvard Law School. It wasn't called Harvard Law School, he was a professor at Harvard. Um, and he wrote these big uh, uh, volumes called The Commentary on the Constitution. So while he was a justice, he, was, he also wrote these like, textbooks, basically, of constitutional law and of all different types of law. He was a remarkable mind. Um, this opinion of his is not well known, right? People know, oh, they know Dred Scott, right? Uh, people don't know Prig. Have you ever heard of Prig before this class? You heard of it? Yeah, um, Good. I read it in undergrad. Good for you, you took a common law class? It was constitutional studies. Good for you. Mo most, most, people, most people never heard of it. You know, they all know Roger Tawney and Dred Scott, but they don't know Prig and Justice Story. Let me tell you something. In terms of practical effect, Dred Scott was not nearly as bad as was Prig. We'll do Dred Scott in a couple weeks. Actually, much sooner, actually. 
but a couple classes. But Prigg legalized the slave catching, right? This created so much misery and oppression for so many years. The holding in Dred Scott was awful, but had a fairly narrow effect of, of whether uh, a, a slave could actually sue in federal court. But as a practical matter, uh, Prigg was, was a much more awful decision. Um, and indeed, after the first Fugitive Slave Act was upheld in Prigg, Congress then enacted an even more stringent one some years later. Uh, so this was a far more significant decision. Um, let's actually walk through Justice Story's analysis, right? So I think Chelsea, you're next. Chelsea, ha where does Justice Story find um, the authority for Congress to, to enact this, this law, this, this Fugitive Slave Act? Exactly. So let's read it, right? We read it a minute ago. Does this provision, Chelsea, actually give Congress the power to enact the clause? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it to say anything about Congress? Yeah. No. No. So, what's, so where's the answer then? Um, what, what, what do we always also look at? Not just Fugitive Slave Clause, what do you also look at? Oh, you're helping. I, can, I have very good hearing. Yeah, the necessary and proper. Okay, here we go, necessary and proper. And, and so this is, I'm drilling this into your brains, right? In any case we study in this class, you always have to consider both. Right, if you just look at the Fugitive Slave Clause, there's nothing about Congress, right? It doesn't say Congress has any power. In contrast, right, Article 1, Section 8, Congress shall have the power to make all laws to carry into execution of the foregoing powers. Now, here's a question, right, Audrey? Is the Fugitive Slave Clause a foregoing power? No. Why do you say no? Because foregoing, I believe that means before. Before. That's in Article 1 versus Article. Article 4 is. After, after going, is that after going, proceeding, I think you say, right? But even, even if you're right, I think, I think it's a good answer, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, Audrey. It says foregoing powers. Powers. Is Article 4 a power? No. No. Why not? What is it? What, what is Article 4? Is it a power for Congress? Very good. Here it doesn't say Very good. So the argument I'm giving you now, I didn't make it up, right? This was actually an argument advanced by uh, a lawyer at the time. His name was Salmon P. Chase. He would later become the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Chase was an attorney in Ohio, uh, Cincinnati. And uh, he was a vigorous abolitionist. He opposed slavery very very vocally. And he would often represent in court uh, fugitive slaves. In fact, he actually gained the nickname as the Attorney General for Runaway Slaves. This was his nickname. Uh, Randy, my colleague, is taking pictures of his grave, has like a little thing for him. Yeah, it's a, he's, Randy's a huge Chase fan, so I've, I've become more of a Chase fan over the years. Um, but Justice Chase made the argument, I think Audrey got both of them. First, foregoing means before, but Article 4 comes after. Second, power means a power to do something, and Article 4 doesn't describe any power. So Chase says, necessary proper clause is not helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't even get you where you need to go. Tyler, does the court accept this sort of narrow reading of the necessary and proper clause? From Justice, does Justice Story accept that argument? They don't. No, they do not. We'll get to the Supremacy Clause in a minute, but let's just focus on necessary and proper for a minute, right? How does Justice Story, who is a very, you know, a, uh, he was a brilliant guy for sure, what case does he rely on? What's his basis to read necessary and proper so broadly?
What case is he citing? We've only, we've only done a couple cases so far, so you're going you to do process elimination pretty easily. I mean, I would, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to guess McCullough. That's right. Uh, when in doubt, choose Marshall. Uh, you're probably right. He cites McCulloch. And he says, the necessary and proper clause provides all the necessary authority. He writes, quote, the end being required, it has been deemed a just and necessary implication that the means to accomplish it are given also. Or in other words, that the power flows as a necessary means to accomplish the end. You've all heard the expression the means to an end, right? We use that expression all the time. No one knows what it actually means. David, what's, let's break it down. A necessary means to accomplish the end. What? I know. We say it all the time, but actually, what does it actually mean? And I keep saying mean, but what, how should we understand that phrase? A necessary means to accomplish the end. Um, so I think in terms of this, it was talking about it, would, it worked because it was protecting the slave owner's rights. Okay, let's take it one at a time. What is the end? What is when I say end, E N D, I'm thinking of like a goal, right, or the purpose. Haven, what was Congress's purpose or end in enacting the Fugitive Slave Act? What was he? What were they trying to accomplish? Uh, to protect the rights of the slaves. <laughs> not, not just yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. To, so they have um, at least a fair trial. Of at least no, not Pennsylvania Congress. Oh. Why did Congress enact the Fugitive Slave Act? What were they trying to achieve? What, what, what did the Fugitive Slave Act do? The federal law. Um, oh, well, it says that it preempts any state law to the contrary. Right, but, but what did the Fugitive Slave Act actually do? I don't know specifically, except for it made that less broad. <laughs> so Chelsea, why did Congress enact the Fugitive Slave Act? Yes. Taking the, from abolishing the rights of. Yes, the basically, yeah. So the Fugitive Slave Act was designed to prevent the northern states, the free states, from basically intruding upon the slavery in the southern states, right? So those are the ends, right? And what Justice Story says is, in light of Article 4, right, in light of Article 4, that's a legitimate end, right? We know that the Constitution has a design to prevent. Uh, free states from interfering with southern states, meddling with, right? So those are the ends. And what are the means they chose? The means they chose were the Future Slave Act, right? That if a slave catcher comes to Pennsylvania, he doesn't have to go through all these hoops. He can just bring the person back. So we ask, do the means accomplish the end, right? Does having the Fugitive Slave Act accomplish the goal of preserving slavery in the South? Yes. That's it, right? So long as the means accomplish the ends, that there's a fit, right? That, that one leads to the other, then Congress can do it. This, what I just described to you, this means end, is what's often called means end scrutiny. Well, courts will ask, okay, what is the government trying to do? What are the ends? And what are the means? What are the way they're using to get there? And so long as there's actually a fit between one and the other, Congress can do it. Here, Justice Story gives a very broad reading of necessary and proper. Right? He says, necessary doesn't mean absolutely necessary. Is it convenient? Right? That's the word that Marshall used in McCulloch. Right? Is it useful? Is having the Future Slave Act, a useful way of preserving slavery in the South? Yeah. Then it's necessary and proper, and Congress has the power to do it. Does that make sense? In fact, Story goes one step further, and he says, if Congress does not have this power, then the Constitution would never have been ratified. He says, if, if we had a situation where the northern states could simply just abolish slavery indirectly, we've never had a Constitution. So he makes a historical claim, which might be true. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. But he makes his claim. As a result, the Fugitive Slave Act was constitutional. And because, I'm sorry, because the Fugitive Slave Act was constitutional, it preempts or trumps the state Pennsylvania Liberty Law, which is invalid. 
Therefore, Pri cannot be prosecuted for violating the state law because it's unconstitutional as applied. All right, questions on Prig. Very important case. Very important case. Yeah, Audrey. For, uh, so it's called the means to an end scrutiny? It's called means end scrutiny, like means dash end scrutiny. It's called means end scrutiny. We'll do a lot of that. But, but you see it here where, where Story writes, the power flows as a necessary means to accomplish the end. He's describing what we now call means end scrutiny, mm-hmm. where we balance the means and the ends. It is. Very good. Very good. You remember something? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, Tyler. Just follow up on that, sir. So do you so that's that's like a bright line two prong analysis that we could employ when breaking down, you know, a time pattern or something like that is necessary and proper linkage to commerce also mm-hmm. are the means legitimate for the appropriate end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll do this at some length, but um, if you look at the videos I, I put for you, a lot of the videos actually have little graphics of what are the means and what are the ends, and you can see how they balance out. It uh, might be helpful for you. Okay. Okay, yeah, graphics are good. All right. So any questions on Prig? Very important case that most people have never heard of. No? Okay, what's our next case? Oh, okay, Chase Court. That's right. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, the next batch of cases were decided uh, when Chief Justice Chase was on, was on the bench. Uh, now, after uh, Justice Taney died, uh, Lincoln replaced the known slavery supporter uh, with the abolitionist. It's a little poetic. And we have three cases decided in the span of th- three or four years. So we have U.S. v. DeWitt, we have Hepburn against Griswold, and we have Knox versus Lee. Uh, Tyler, you want to give me the facts in, uh, in Knox, please? In Knox. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, DeWitt. I, I, my brain fried. I'm sorry. Oh, Didn't mean to freak you out. <laughs> I know, it's worse than they like, what case do we have to read? No, I'm sorry, DeWitt, the first one. Uh, so DeWitt was uh, on the oil. Um, yeah. Congress had read, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I guess it didn't have a name, or it was just a general act. I couldn't find anybody associated with it. Mm-hmm. Um, an act that regulated by means of declaring what type of oil transactions were illegal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and DeWitt uh, was charged uh, with violation you know, of that particular um, act. And so the question before the court was whether uh, the act in itself was constitutional. Well, one, was there a violation? And, and secondly, was it you know, constitutional in and of itself to charge him with a misdemeanor for uh, this particular Mm-hmm. Um, ultimately, um, it came down to or the, the phrase I recall: "Commerce Clause is not enough mm-hmm. in this particular case to define within a particular territory, within a state's jurisdiction, um, what is and is not uh, illegal in terms of commerce. Uh, so, therefore, that entire act uh, under which the way was indicted wasn't valid." Mm-hmm. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, so um, Fabian, let me ask you this question. Um, can Congress tax the sale of oil within a given state? Yes. You sure? Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I, no conflict, so I'm asking first, all right, so first, can Congress tax the sale of oil in a given state? No. Oh, you're right the first time. Okay. Yeah, they can. They, they can, right? Yeah. So Congress can tax the sale of oil. Now let me ask you a follow-up question, Fabian. Um, let's say Congress has a tax on oil A, the first type of oil, right? And say they're making lots of money off the sale of this oil. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Congress doesn't have a tax on oil B, the second kind of oil. Can Congress ban the sale of oil B as a way to create incentives for people to buy oil A and generate more revenue? No. Why not? No, because, um, oh, it says, okay, in order to enforce the powers 
He did. Okay, so here's the government. Thank you. Very good. So here's the government's argument, right? The government said, look, we have the power to regulate. I'm sorry, we have the power to lay and collect taxes. Where is it? Uh, I don't have it. it. It's in the Constitution, I promise. Here we go. Uh, no, I don't have it. Whatever. It's there. Article 1, Section 1. Um, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 says, Congress has the power to lay and collect taxes. And Congress, in fact, had taxes on some oils, but not others. And the government came and said, look, we have to ban the sell of these other oils that we're not taxing in order to improve our tax collecting methodology. In other words, ban B so people buy more of A and pay taxes on it. Makes sense, right? Mm. Well, so first off, we have a lesson. Congress can tax local activity, but they can't regulate local activity. Whoa. Did, didn't, didn't we say in Gibbons v. Ogden that Congress can't regulate exclusively local activity, but they can tax it? You're already seeing the seeds of where we're going in a couple of classes. But the argument then is, if Congress has a power to tax, and taxing is a foregoing power, then Congress can ban the sale of oil as a means to accomplish the collection of taxes. Right Here are the means and the ends. What is the end they're trying to do? Raising tax money. What is the mean they're choosing? Banning the sale of the things that's not being taxed, the other type of oil. So we ask them, what is the fit, right? Is there a close enough relationship between banning the sale of oil B and collecting tax on oil A? I think Faven said it correctly a moment ago. Chief Justice Chase rejects that line of argument. He says there's too big of a gap. It's too remote. That's the word he uses, right? It's too remote between criminalizing the sale of oil to, to, as a means to increase tax revenue on some other product. Right? It's, it's a bad analogy. You're right. He says, merely increasing the production and sale of other oils and the revenue from them is not enough. It's too remote. It's not necessary. So think of the necessary and proper clause, right? What, what Chief Justice Chase is saying is that this law this ban on oil is not really necessary to raise taxes. That there are other ways in which the government can raise taxes. So usually around this time I get a question. All right? The question is about McCulloch. Okay, you're next. What's your, what's your question? Right. Is there any factors that come into play other than just is there another way to well, the Well, this is, uh, you mentioned the word scrutiny before. I don't want to get there quite yet. But when you're asking how close is the fit, are you asking is this the only way to raise taxes? Is this maybe one of several ways of, ra of raising taxes? Or maybe there are other ways you can do it, right? These sorts of questions fit different types of scrutiny. If you're, use the word strict scrutiny, is this the only way you can raise taxes? Of course not. Is this a good way of raising taxes? Maybe, maybe not. Um, is this a reasonable way of raising taxes? Yeah. Is this a single, is this a uh, plausible way of raising taxes? Yeah. Or do we simply say, it's not for us to judge, let Congress decide and defer to Congress? Right? There are different ways you can approach this analysis. In McCulloch, Chief Justice Marshall seemed to have a very broad definition of necessary. And Randy and I fight about this. How did we do it on the graphic? I forgot how we actually we fought about this at some length. I, see, I, he put McCulloch and Dewey at the same level. I would have put Dewey a little bit lower, but, but I, I see it as my colleague. But at least it's not as broad as was Prig. Right? What Prig basically said is, if the means have some fit with the ends, if there's some way that criminalizing uh, a slave, uh, or allowing slave catchers to run around to protect slaveholders' rights, that's good enough. But here what Chase is saying is, this law is stupid. Right? If you're trying to raise revenue, impose a tax on oil number B, 
don't criminalize the sale of oil. Why? Because this is local activity. This oil has never crossed state lines. And the state, I'm sorry, and Congress lacks what's often called the police power. Right? Congress can't regulate exclusively local activity. Right? The government says taxing power linked with necessary and proper. Chase says no. Notice they didn't rely on the, on the um, Commerce Clause, right? They didn't even talk about it. Because commerce was understood to be things of cross state lines. Uh, this was not commerce among the states in any way. It was totally internal, so they looked at the taxing power. So as a result, the conviction was overturned, and the court ruled in DeWitt that the um, uh, uh, Congress could not regulate this local sale of activity with a very narrow, here I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see this. There we go. With a very narrow reading of the uh, necessary and proper clause. Yeah, I, I, I would frankly put DeWitt even lower than McCulloch. I think Rand, Randy, Randy says that Chase followed McCulloch's lead. I think he was a little bit more stringent. I think, I think, I think Marshall would have upheld this prosecution, but you know, we, we, we can disagree on stuff. His name comes first, alphabetically. Okay, so any questions then on DeWitt? No? Okay, uh, who's next? You next? I, I think you're next, yeah. All right, so let's do the next case, right? The next case is um, United States versus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Hepburn versus Griswold, right? And if you ever look at a dollar bill, I'm sure you've looked a hundred times, maybe you never noticed. It says in the front, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. You ever notice that? You ever look at that? Okay, why, why is this, it says it, right, take out any bill, right? It says, this knows legal tender for all debts, public and private, right? Why is that, 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 that message on your money? Well, what the hell is this? This is a piece of paper. It's actually not even paper, it's mostly like cotton and stuff in there, right? Why does this little piece of paper have any actual value? The reason why is US government says, uh, we have deemed this to be a valid method of money. Today, we accept paper currency um, as a given. Right? In fact, I don't even like coins. I usually get rid of them. Uh, and in fact, even the coins that we have aren't actual coins. They're not really made out of gold or silver. They may have other little filler metals right? that, that don't have any actual worth. In fact, a penny, I think, costs more to make than it's actually worth. It should be abolished. Kill the penny. I, I agree. Um, but initially, at the time of the founding, currency was actually made out of precious metals, gold or silver. Silver. In fact, the phrase dollar, right, didn't refer to a piece of paper. It referred to a Spanish coin. The Spanish dollar is made of silver. And there's a picture of it in the video. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring it up. Um, so we actually had, uh, uh, here we go. I'll show you what the dollar coin looked like. I'm still figuring out how to do this in a class in real time. I'm not sure how to use it best. Uh, oh, I love the shot. Okay, uh, show, show the dollar coin. That's it. So that, that's what a Spanish dollar coin actually looked like back in the day. Um, paper, uh, uh, money was made out of gold. Um, during the Civil War, there were huge financial crises. And then as a way to avoid them, Congress decided to create paper money. And this was actually the bill. Um, indeed, Whose face is that? That's Salmon Chase. Right? At the time, Salmon Chase was the Secretary of the Treasury under Lincoln. And they actually put his face on the paper currency. It's called a greenback. Um, and if you see in the bottom, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts in public and private. That's the exact same message that's on your bill right now. It's the exact same wording. See what it says? This note is legal tender for all debts and, and blah, blah. You see the same thing in your dollar bill today. So there's no question Congress can print paper money, right? They can do that. that. That's fine. The question is, can people be compelled to accept it? And that was a subject at issue in Hepburn against Griswold. And the case arose in basically a, a totally boring fact, right? Mrs. Hepburn tried to pay a debt to Mr. Griswold with paper money. 
Mr. Grizzle said, uh-uh, this is worthless paper. I don't want it. So he went to court and he said, I'm not going to accept it. I want to sue for a judgment. So the case actually arose out of basically a simple debt dispute. It wasn't like we were going to challenge the constitutionality of the Legal Tender Act. No, no, no. It was a lot simpler, right? They just said, um, I'm not going to accept this bill. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. All right, so uh, a favorite. Walk me through then Justice Chase's analysis uh, about the Legal Tender Act and this paper money. Very good. Necessary and, um, proper cost to make it a legal tender. Very good. Very good. Very good. Okay, so Chief Justice Chase says, look, Congress has the power to regulate commerce. Congress has the power to coin money. Congress has the power to borrow money. Right? Paper money will certainly make it easier for Congress to do those things. Right? So Congress can print its own money as a way of regulating commerce and borrowing money. But the key question here is, can they make it legal tender? That is, can they make people accept it? Right? If you want to voluntarily accept paper money, go for it. You're an idiot. Right? This is worthless stuff. I don't care. It's, just, it's, it's, it's not worth the paper it's printed on. Can they make people print it? Chase says no. He writes, an act making mere promises to pay dollars a legal tender in payments is not a means appropriate, plainly adapted, really calculated to carry into effect any express power vested in Congress. This is the means and scrutiny again, right? What are the ends they're trying to achieve? Uh, regulating commerce, uh, borrowing money, etc. What are the means? Forcing poor Mr. Griswold to accept paper money. He says, you don't need that, right? You can do everything the same. You can regulate commerce without making Mr. Griswold accept this paper money. In other words, there's not a close enough fit between the means you're using, the ends that you're trying to achieve. This is too big of a gap, right? Congress can use other methods. Again, R Randy thinks that this is consistent with McCulloch. I go back and forth. I, th I think this is even more stringent than Marshall. Um, but without question, it's more stringent than Prigg and Justice Story, right? It's basically asking, could Congress achieve this goal in a different way? Then do that. Don't do this, right? Use a more precise method to get there. Don't force people to accept this worthless paper money that then um, diminishes their, 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 uh, their debts that are owed. Because if you have a debt that's owed and you have to pay with paper money, you don't get the full value of your debt. Uh, uh, debtors love this. Creditors hated it because the creditors were getting screwed with all this paper money printed during the Civil War. And just only pause. Chase was the guy who approved of the bill in the first place. He said it was fine. And then as a judge, said, nah, never mind. It's a fascinating story. OK. Everyone with me so far? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yes, Tyler. Um, Whose who's signature was on that? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, oh, my goodness. Um, well, hold on. Let me, let me look at it a little bit more closely. Well, that's a section of the treasury, so that's got to be Sam and Pete Chase. This one doesn't pull up. It just looks different. Uh, I think it says Treasurer of the United States. Whoever the, I, it, yeah, Secretary of Treasury. Uh, you know, come up after. I have a very, I have a high resolution version. I'll look at it after class. I'm not sure. That's a good question. I, that, the first one definitely says Secretary of the Treasury. Um, does it look like Chase, though? I don't know. Good question. All right. Um, OK, so we have the vote in Hepburn. Uh, the vote's a, li a little funky here. Uh, the graphic here is actually helpful. When Hepburn was first argued, there were five votes to argue that the Legal Tender Act was unconstitutional. And there were three votes that it was constitutional. It was a shorthanded court. Uh, but then Justice Greer uh, resigned. He poof, goes away. So then basically when the case was decided, you only have four to three. And I want to pause on this, thing, on this point for a moment. Uh, Faven, what does it mean when the court declares a law unconstitutional? What does it actually do?
the we've become voided. What does that mean, voided? Do we take well, a do we take a scissor and cut out of the of the of the U.S. code? No. Throw in the garbage. It just means the constitutional intent is what preempts. Okay. So but but so what? So does the law no longer have effect? Um, no, it still has an effect. It's only if it um, if that law's intent or whatever is conflicting with the intent of the constitution. Well, so okay, here in Hepburn they declare the law unconstitutional. Is that the end of the law? Um, well, no, because they vote on it. <laughs> you know the ending. About a year later, they, they change their opinion, right? Yeah. But how, if the court already voided, to use your language, voided a law, how do they unvoid it? How do you unconstitutional, un unconstitutionalize a law? You have to relook at it again and interpret it differently. But how can that be? So let me blow your minds for a little bit. Um, this is basic, right? Um, in any lawsuit, A sues B. Here, Mr. was a Griswold, right? Sued Mrs. Hepburn. They had a dispute over a debt. And the court held that the Legal, ten the Legal Tender Act was unconstitutional. And therefore, Mr. Hepburn, I'm sorry, Mr. Griswold did not have to accept the paper money. Chelsea did that. Ruling applied to anyone else beyond Mr. Griswold and Mrs. Hepburn. You want to say yes, but the answer is no. This is basic CIFPRA, right? You have race judicata, right? If you have parties, you have a plaintiff and defendant, and there's a judgment there, that judgment binds the plaintiff and the defendant. It does not bind the rest of the world. Everyone thinks the Supreme Court's different, but it's not, right? It was a conflict between two parties. The US government wasn't even a party to this case, right? I don't know if the US government filed a brief in the case. Maybe they did, I might have to look it up later. After Hepburn versus Griswold, the Legal Tender Act wasn't like removed from the US code. It wasn't like cut out of the statute books. It was still there. It was still there. So a year later, another case, Knox against Lee, can reissue it again. So it's not just reconsidering the law, right? The law still exists. Courts only issue judgments between parties A and parties B. And this case proves that fact. That the mere fact that four justices say a law is unconstitutional doesn't get rid of the law altogether. And I think it does a lot of work to dispel, to, to get rid of the myth that the courts are, you know, um, uh, final, and in which they're not. They can reverse themselves. Right? So what happened? About a year later, President Ulysses S. Grant put two new members in the court, Strong and Bradley. And they were both supporters of paper money, the Legal Tender Act. And another case came to the court, Knox against Lee, and they flipped, right? There was a 5-4 majority one way. I'm sorry, there's a 4-3, now it's a 5-4 the other way. In the span of basically a year, the court changed their opinion. Yeah, Audrey? Why did they add two more justices? There were vacancies. So initially, there was one vacancy. I think someone died. And then Justice Greer re retired, right? So there were four to three. There were seven justices. There were two vacancies. And then Pres President Grant filled the two vacancies. And now there were five, four the other way. So as a result, in Knox against Lee, which I didn't make you read, but it, you can get the gist of it, uh, the court declares legal tender act constitutional. So. If you ask me what a pet peeve is, it's, it's, a, it's a big one, which I don't expect of you. But uh, I don't like the phrase struck down. If I use it, I bite myself. Because uh, courts don't strike laws down. This is proof. The law got, like, you know, Jesus, it got resurrected, right? A couple, about a year later. Um, it was resurrected. It came back to life. Courts don't void laws. All courts can do is tell people you can't do this in a given dispute between X and Y, Hepburn and Griswold. But the court did more than that in Knox versus Lee. The court adopted, as Randy likes to say, perhaps the broadest construction of federal power ever. I mean, I, just if you look at the diagram, uh, basically, Knox is almost as high as like modern day cases. Um, it was broader than McCulloch, it was broader than Prigg. Justice. Uh, Justice Strong, who was a new grant appointee, he wrote 
uh, the non-enumerated powers, that's implied powers in the necessary and proper clause, reach beyond the execution of all powers entrusted to Congress and mentioned in detail. Right? The existence of these powers can be deduced from more than one power, all of them combined. The court wrote in Knox that, the, that, that um, Congress has the power of self-preservation. My goodness, self-preservation. Um, he also explains that in times of an emergency, during the Civil War, that this power becomes even more important, which raises the question, does the Congress get more powers in times of war? And after the war is over, do those powers disappear? Uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, the court later held in a case uh, Juilliard versus Greenman, which is in your book, I didn't assign it, uh, that even legal tenders are fine after the war is concluded. Um, so whatever gains were made by Chief Justice Chase and DeWitt and Hepburn were wiped out in the Knox case a couple years later. I mean, a year and a half later, basically. Uh, Chase dissented in uh, Knox and he said this basically gives Congress an absolute and unlimited power. Once you construe implied powers as broadly, there is no limit. Uh, Chase died about two years later. Um, there would be sort of a resurrection, though, of the Chase view uh, during the Progressive Era. We'll go to those cases in a few minutes. But for some time, the Knox view was, uh, was the law of the land. Questions on the legal tender cases? Questions on the legal tender cases? No? All right, let's move on. Um, so the last topic we have for today is the progressive era. Um, a lot of students don't know what that means, progressive era. Uh, the Progressive Era generally is understood to mean the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And the word pro progressive is generally based on the word progress, depending how you define it, uh, which means advancing society. And the progressives uh, wanted to improve society in a number of regards, and they primarily did so through uh, the use of government, both the federal and the state government. So they had um, laws improving labor conditions, uh, laws improving sanitation conditions, uh, laws improving public education, uh, prohibition, banning of alcohol, uh, banning lottery tickets, banning all forms of immorality, right? These were very eager beavers. They were very excited to try and change the world. Um, and they did so at both the state and federal level. We will study state progressive laws in the second half of the semester we talk about the 14th Amendment. Um, now we're talking about uh, enumerated powers where Congress, the federal government, tries to enact these sorts of progressive laws. And we have three cases for today. We have um, United States versus E.C. Knight from 1895. We have Champion against Ames from 1903. And Hammer versus Dagenhart from 1918. Okay, and these three cases will basically take us up until next class when we start the Roosevelt years. Okay, uh, I, I, who's next? I keep forgetting. Chelsea, okay, thank you. Glad someone remembers. Okay, uh, you want to give me the facts, please, in EC Night? Um, so there was um, the American Sugar Company, and there was four um, competitors. Mm -hmm. What's this? What, what was the scheme? Um, they wanted to monopolize. Monopoly. Okay, so what's what's a monopoly, Chelsea? We all know the board game, right? Mm -hmm. What's a monopoly? Where they're the only ones that do that. Were, were they the only one? Were there others? Okay, it's an unfair question, right? Monopoly is a fairly broad term, um, but it generally refers to when one company has. Uh, too much market share, right? That they control too much of the market. Not 
perhaps the entire market, right? There might be other competitors, but they have a huge market share. And the fear is that when a company is too big, it can then hurt consumers because if there's no one else to buy it from, they can jack up prices, they can reduce quality, they can exploit their workers, go down the list, right? Um, as a result, Congress enacts the Sherman Antitrust Act, a very famous piece of legislation. And the Sherman Antitrust Act allows the federal government to prosecute monopolists. Um, so then the question becomes, Audrey, what power gives Congress, I'm sorry, what enumerated power does, uh, can Congress rely on to ban monopolies? Okay, that that's a start. But I'm thinking in my head now. Mm. Say the question all over again. What power gives Congress the ability to prohibit monopolies? Well, if you were the government, what, what power would you rely on? What, if you were the, yeah, yeah, of course, right? So think of it this way, right? What exactly is a sugar business? Okay, I've never worked in a sugar factory. I'm sure you have, right? Now, there's some aspects of a sugar business that involve interstate commerce, right? They're going to be shipping sugar cane from the Caribbean or from the South or wherever else, right? They're going to be transporting sugar in a little bag from one state to another. So there's a lot of... Um, interstate commerce that goes on after the sugar is made. The actual manufacture of sugaring is usually in a single factory in one state where all the workers are in that one state and they're refining the sugar, they put it in a bag, and then the sugar gets shipped off to whatever destination, right? E.C. Knight is not arguing that Congress can't ban the shipment of sugar. Right? That's the important point here. No one argues that Congress lacks the power to ship, I'm sorry, no one's arguing that Congress lacks the power to ban the shipment of sugar or the shipment of sugar cane across state lines. No one's arguing that. What the argument is, is they cannot regulate, they cannot prohibit the manufacture or the refinement of sugar in a single factory. Right? Part of what E.C. Knight was doing was subject to federal control, but the rest of it wasn't. Congress said, we're going to ban the entire enterprise. We're going to shut you down, shut down the entire company, which means they're shutting down the interstate activity as well as the intrastate activity, the activity within a single state, intrastate. You'll learn the difference. Interstate means between state. Intrastate means within a state. Think of like the internet and the intranet, right? Within a state versus multiple states. So without question, Congress can regulate interstate commerce, but can they regulate intrastate activity? Okay. So Tyler, walk me through the majority opinion by Chief Justice Fuller. This is that's him, by the way, with that mustache. That's that's Chief Justice Melville Fuller. Commerce is seed manufacturer. What does that mean? What's that term? What does that mean? That it comes after. It's not Bingo. Part of it. it's after the fact. Exactly. So within the jurisdiction of the state. Gibbons and another case I'm not familiar with Brown um, talking about what states can do, uh, the, uh, the, the types of thing that constitutes interstate commerce among the other states. And that's not what we're talking about in the manufacturing mm -hmm. process. While they didn't discuss necessarily and proper specifically, um, the Constitution didn't necessarily define uh, what the states could do to protect you know, that commercial uh, commerce, that commercial intercourse between the states. Very good. What was finite was that this means was not the, the McCullough uh, test uh, you know, allowed the, uh, the court to conclude that the ends were legitimate, protecting trade and commerce uh, to make the means appropriate to support the suppression of monopolies. Okay, very good. 
the key phrase here is that commerce succeeds to manufacture and is not part of it. Right? Why is that important? Because Congress can only regu uh, regulate the stuff that comes after the stuff is made, after the sugar is made. They can't shut down the entire business. Perhaps they can regulate part of the shipment of it, but they can't shut down the entire business. And he does cite Gibbons v. Ogden, which says that Congress cannot regulate commerce that is local to a single state, exclusively within one state. Okay? There was a dissent here, uh, and you always need to read the dissents. They're very, very important. Uh, and the dissent by a man who's called the great dissenter, John Marshall Harlan, one of my icons. He was uh, the dissenter in Plessy, dissenter in civil rights cases, dissented in a lot, a lot of cases you'll read. But John Marshall had a dissent that took a very different perspective on this case. It was a five to four decision. So Faven, walk me through the John uh, Justice Harlan dissent, please. Very good. And he breaks it down into like three questions and he pretty much says, so um, are the ends, you know, what are the ends that the government is trying to like achieve and with the protection of trade and commerce between states against unlawful restraint? Mm -hmm. And then he goes on further and he says, well, you know, what was the means that the government chose to use and this, this question would not be a reason. And um, Harlan says, was this appropriate? And he, he says it's appropriate. And he said because um, the means to the ends that the Sherman Antitrust Act is constitutional. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, I think that Harlan is consistent with John Marshall and McCulloch. And I think that Chief Justice Fuller is consistent with Chase in uh, uh, DeWitt and uh, Hepburn, right? And this is why uh, this timeline, I think, is helpful to illustrate at a, at a, at a high level um, where things are, but the progressive era cases really dialed it back down to the to the to where the Chase Court was. And so Marshall, I'm sorry, not Marshall, I'm sorry. His name is John Marshall Harlan. He's actually named after John Marshall. Uh, so I'm, I'm mostly right. Um, Justice Harlan wrote that the Constitution does not define the means that may be employed to protect the freedom of commercial intercourse. Right? What are the ends? Congress can regulate interstate commerce. What are the means Congress chose to get there? Banning monopolization. Right? Think about it this way. If Congress wants to prevent expensive sugar from fl flooding the marketplace, right? Congress wants to ban the shipment of expensive sugar across state lines. What's one way they can do that? By banning the manufacture of monopoly sugar. Right? If you ban the manufacture of monopoly sugar, then you won't have monopolist sugar being shipped across state lines. Harlan says, that's all you need, right? It's a means to protect the freedom of commercial intercourse. And Congress has the power to enact all laws necessary and proper to carry into execution the power to regulate commerce, right? What are the ends? What are the goals? The protection of trade and commerce among the states from lawful restraints. Are those goals legitimate? Yeah, I think so. What means did the government choose? Shutting down monopolies. Are those means appropriate? Harlan said yes. Because the means fit the ends, Harlan says, the Sherman Act, the prosecution was constitutional. Um, so what you're seeing really is not justices that um, are applying the same test. They, they're applying, I think, different frameworks, right? If you take the majority's approach that commerce comes after manufacturing, uh, then the, the ends are not legitimate, right? Congress doesn't have the power to intrude upon the local police power. But if you say that Congress can prevent the ship, things from being shipped, then yeah, they can take it one step earlier and ban it, All right? So at what stage can Congress intervene? That's the question presented. Questions. Questions on EC Night. Yes, go ahead. Slight question. Please. So, like, you know, kind of like what I was saying um, yesterday, I was asking when you learn like the rule, I feel like it's usually one rule. 
Yeah, it's not. not no. No. So. Uh, that, that that's your role. That's your role statement. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. So it's we'll like get there. Ah, that's, uh, that's a that's a good word. I like framework. Um, that that that's your rule. Um, unfortunately, it's not a consistent approach, and the justices often apply things in slightly different fashions, which is, which is why um, common law is going to be different than your torts or your contracts or your other classes. Okay. It's so. not. Uh, there's no restatement second of constitutional law that doesn't exist. It's not a thing. There's no uniform constitutional code that we don't have that. Our law, our cases, is this. I mean, I can give you the Constitution. You can read it in about an hour. It's short, right? It fits in your pocket. But this entire body of case law, which is basically the first half of our class, um, is very different. Yeah, Audrey? I think the majority in um, EC Knight was consistent with Justice Chase, yeah. And, then the and, and it, it's sort of on the same level. So here's the DeWitt and, there, and then the, yeah, yeah, they're on the same level. It's, it's, here, let me, let me zoom in so it's a little easier for you to see. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still figuring out how best to use this in class. I don't know yet. Um, there it is. That's a good shot. So I think the majority in DeWitt and he Knight are on the same level. And then you see the next case, we'll do in a minute, it goes up a little bit. And then the dissent in Carlin is... I think it's consistent Marshall. with... I think it's more like Marshall. But they get, Rand, 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 Randy maintains that uh, Chase and Marshall on the same level. I don't think so, but we... I'll, I'll give up that fight. We don't, we, we don't grant everything. We, we really don't. We, we grant like 90%. Yeah, yeah, good. Another question. Um, so just about... Is this way of like understanding the rules, is it um, specific just to con law? Because I know it's not like, like you said, it's not I like don't think so will help you in other classes. I teach property also. Have you taken property yet? No. <laughs> this will not help you in property. Okay. Like when I teach you property, I don't do any of this stuff. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it'll help you. It, it's, con law is a unique class because it's the study of development of American history. It's, 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 it's not just fixed rules. It's cases decided. I mean, think about it, right? The first cases with the Bank of the United States, this was a time when we had these serious financial problems in the United States. We needed this bank. Then you have the Fugitive Slave Clause with this huge raging debate over slavery, right? Then you have the legal tender cases after the Civil War with all this paper money. What are we going to do? And then you have you know, the Progressive Year with all these uh, bans on monopoly. What are you gonna, so you have to view the case in the time which was decided. Yeah. Me right now, I'm kind of like putting myself in the justice's shoes. Yeah. It's like being John Malkovich, right? It's it's it's, it's an awful place to be. You know, being Anthony Kennedy, God, Lord help us. Mm -hmm. He's not on the court anymore. I am so grateful to read any more of his opinions. They're done. They're done. Whatever. All the Kennedy opinions are done. I've no no more of them to read. I'm grateful. Read them all. This ones I need to read. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions in EC Knight? All right, let's do the next case, Champion against Ames. Um, today, virtually every state in the union, I think Alabama is one exception. Every state in the union except Alabama has a lottery, right? You don't even think about the lottery. They're commercial with every billboard. Every night on TV, they announce the winners and make a, make a millions, and you scratch the little thing off and whatever. Um, but if you think about it, it's gambling, right? It's gambling. You're, you're, you're paying some amount of money for the chance that your ticket generates a, a prize. And it's a scam. It's, 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 you're not going to win. I've never once bought a lottery ticket in my life. I will never do it. It's, it's, it's a scam. It's, I had a teacher in high school that so was a, a tax on the poor, as he liked to call it. Um, anyway, at the time, the 20th century, early 20th century, there was a strong moral opposition to lotteries, that they were considered uh, sinful, that, that, that people were being taken over by these evil spirits, basically. Not like you know, d demons, but like it was, it was the work of the devil, right? These were evil lotteries. Um, states had bans on lotteries, right, on the sale of lottery tickets. And the states, there's really no problem because states had the police power and they can regulate for the public welfare morality. But then Congress enacts a law. Specifically, Congress banned the interstate shipment 
of lottery tickets. The interstate shipment of lottery tickets. Okay. So this case is different than DeWitt, right? DeWitt was about the sale of oil in one state. Here, you actually had something crossing state lines, right, which is lottery tickets. But then the question becomes, is the movement of lottery tickets from one state to the other commerce, right? This case, Champion, it's so good law actually, so good law, uh, relates back to Gibbons, right? Gibbons sort of defined commerce as intercourse. So then Justice Harlan, who wrote the majority opinion in Champion, has to decide, is a lottery ticket commerce? Who's next? Yeah, I think I... Is a lottery ticket commerce? Uh, Justice Harlan says yes. Yes. Why? Because uh, that lottery ticket, since they cross state lines, is subject to traffic or to go into interstate commerce, so that means it's subject to commerce because it's it has to under commerce. Well, now, 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 let's just be precise here, right? Are we only talking about the commerce clause here, or we're also talking about the other one? Yeah, so let's just, just think about this for a minute, right? Is the actual lottery ticket itself commerce? No. No. But the shipment of them by these carriers is. Right? So think of it this way, right? Congress can't ban a lottery ticket by itself, but they can ban the shipment of the lottery tickets. Because the shipment of the lottery tickets is the interstate commerce. And Harlan says, as basically, he doesn't say it, but what he's getting at is, as a necessary and proper means to prohibit the shipment, we can prohibit the tickets themselves. Right? You're banning a specific type of commerce, shipment, with necessary and proper. They always have to work in tandem. And what would kill students is they don't even say necessary and proper, but it's always lurking in the background. Justice Harlan writes, Lottery tickets, lottery tickets are subjects of traffic and therefore are subjects of commerce. And the regulation of the carriage, the carriage being the thing transporting them across state lines, like a wagon, think of, or, or a train car. Or the transportation of such tickets from state to state by these carriers is a regulation of commerce among the several states. So here Congress is using both its commerce and necessary and proper clause power. Now, just one, one thing to pause. I, I think this question's flagged in the, in the reading, Tyler. Does the power to regulate include the power to ban outright, prohibit? That's the discussion in Congress. Yeah. You know, they say that they have um, subjects of traffic, and they have the power to ban outright, prohibit. Yeah. So there's this debate, right? Does the power to regulate include the power to ban? So perhaps Congress could say that if you want to ship lottery tickets, you have to have maybe a license or maybe you need to have it in a certain way, but to actually ban it altogether. Harlan says there's no problem. He makes an analogy. He says, Congress can, I'm sorry, the states can ban the local sale of lottery tickets. If the states can ban the sale of lottery tickets, why can't Congress ban the sale of lottery tickets? So, Faven, what's the problem with that argument, right? That if the states can do it, why can't Congress do it? Why is that, why is that argument problematic? Yes, right. What do states have that Congress doesn't have? What's that thing called? The P. Power? Police power. Police power, exactly. Harlan here seems to analogize the um, state police power with the federal power. The federal government doesn't have a police power. And also Harlan discusses immorality and that Congress has the power to eliminate immoral uses. And that, that, that principle is still cited to this day. Now there's no enumerated power to Congress show the power to eliminate immorality, uh, but it, it's based on necessary and proper. Okay? Now Harlan does limit it. He adds what he calls, or what Randy likes to call the limiting principle based on the 10th Amendment. And he writes, 
that Congress cannot interfere with traffic or commerce and lottery tickets carried on exclusively within the limits of any state. So Cong uh, commerce is exclusive in a single state. Exclusive, right? That's not for Congress. Now what does exclusive mean? This goes back to Gibbons, right? Marshall had a very similar thing. If it's a commerce exclusively in one state, it's for the states. Um, this is no longer a good law, right? This, this limiting principle was abandoned during the New Deal. But at least Harlan tries to put some limit on it. He recognizes that if his opinion is taken seriously, it can be very problematic. OK, so any questions on the majority opinion, Justice Fuller? I'm sorry, Justice Harlan. Yeah, yeah, Ch uh, Tyler. The, uh, one thing I, that stood out, I, I don't know if you heard anything, but I missed it. Uh, it looked like the, the tickets were coming from a company based in Paraguay, wasn't it? Correct. Yeah. Does Congress have the power to say no imports? Or that yes. Can't yeah. Could yeah. That yes, they could. Yeah. In fact, it's not just the interstate commerce clause, it's also the foreign commerce clause. Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations. So they could ban the importation of the Paraguayan lottery tickets, but this is about whether they can ban them shipping across state lines. What is the relationship, um, Ms. Berger, the full case, the, the actual uh, parties in this case, what was their relationship? Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I'm actually not sure. They said conspiracy, so it looks like a... It, it was a ring of people selling lottery tickets, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I, I'm not sure it's a good question. I'll think about it. All right, so any other questions then on the majority, Justice Harlan? Um, Chief Justice Fuller was in dissent. Now, he had just been the majority in, in E.C. Knight. Now they flipped over. He's in dissent. And he writes, the power to prohibit lotteries belongs to the states. A congressional general police power over interstate commerce, he wrote, defeats the operation of the Tenth Amendment. You cannot have a general police power in the federal government. Okay. Are there any questions on Hammer? I'm sorry, on Champion. No? This class moves so much faster than my usual classes. I'm almost done. It's actually uh, very good. So I have no objection. All right. Uh, last case. I don't know why it moves quicker. It's not that like maybe fewer questions. I'm not sure. Just usually I'm pushing to the last minute or leisurely. Uh, last class, uh, last case. Hammer versus Dagenhart. Um, you know, today I think we take for granted that there are laws banning um, child labor. Uh, we have laws involving compulsory education, so if you're below a certain age, you're going to school. You're not working. Um, but at a different time, with different economies, that wasn't always feasible. I had one, uh, I, had one I, went, I went to George Mason. Did you ever take an economics class at Mason? I took one my senior year. Which one? Oh, it was like an intro to like, um, like money planning or something. Which professor, do you remember the name? I had a TA. Yeah, I didn't have an actual one. Okay, so Mason is one of the most well-known uh, classical liberal economic programs in the country. They're very, very libertarian. And I had one professor. Uh, my final exam question for the law and economics was, uh, Ryan, I say defending child labor. N not child labor laws, defending child labor as an institution. And the general thrust was uh, when people are poor and starving, not allowing children to work makes them actually worse off. Um, in many countries where you ban child labor, it actually increases in child prostitution and human trafficking. You don't eliminate demand by just banning it. The demand doesn't disappear. But during the early 20th century, uh, a lot of states permitted child labor. Um, and there was a serious movement among progressives to ban it. And Congress tried to pass a law that would regulate child labor. But they did it in a specific fashion. Right? Uh, who's next? Uh, yeah, Tyler. So in, in Hammer, what exactly did the law of Congress enact do? Describe this law. It was prohibition of goods um, sold that had been made by children, produced um, and driven, manufactured, and this was produced, produced by children. So again, prior to the commerce side of the house. 
Okay, very good. Um, so what did Congress not do? Congress did not pass law banning child labor, right? They did not pass law that banned a, an employer from having children workers. They didn't do that. They couldn't do that. That law was unconstitutional, right? Under the rule in E.C. Knight, manufacture is not commerce. Right? Again, in E.C. Knight, they tried to ban manufacturing monopoly sugar. So they learned the lesson. They can't do that. So they said, okay, we'll do something else. We're not going to ban employing children. We're not going to ban child labor. We will ban the shipment of products manufactured with child labor, right? Isn't that exactly what EC9 said you could do, right? Commerce comes first, then comes the shipment. I'm sorry, manufacture comes first, then comes the shipment, the commerce. So here, were they doing exactly what the court said, Faven? Did, didn't Hammer say that you know, didn't Knight say that you can ban the shipment of monopoly sugar? Um, yes. So what's the problem? Why why is this why is this law problematic then? Um, it was problematic because they were really trying to change the aim. What do you mean they were really trying to change? What, what do you mean? Just spell that out for a little bit more, please. Um, what when I say they were really trying yeah. to change, I mean Wait a minute, but what do you mean they were really trying to do? Let's just let's take this one step at a time, right? Fabian. All the law says is it's a crime to ship goods made with child labor. Are you saying that's not really their goal? Oh, I'm saying... You're, you're actually right. You're exactly right. But what actually is the goal of the law then? I think, I think the real goal of the law that they wanted was to make a law against child labor. Okay. So you're saying that what Congress is saying is different from what they actually are doing? In other words, their intent doesn't, they're trying to do something other than what the law says. Yeah. Okay, so this is a very early example of where the court um, scrutinizes government action and basically calls BS. They say, look, you're not actually interested in banning the shipment of goods in interstate commerce. What you're actually trying to do, in Justice Day's words, is to standardize the age at which children may be employed. Right? That the end that they're trying to achieve, right, is prohibited. Right? What they're actually trying to achieve is not just banning the shipment. They're trying to put pressure that if you can't ship these child-made goods, then firms aren't going to make them, right? One second. If, if you can't ship these goods across state lines, then you're not going to make them. And if you can't make them, that's then intruding upon the state's police power. Right now, when the, okay, I promise a second, Fabian. Okay. One of the crazy things about this case is who actually brought it? Child. A child who wanted to work. Now, query, I don't know if this was his, his father's idea or his idea. But this was a suit by basically saying a child saying, I want to work, and the federal government's not letting me. My state lets me work, but the Congress will not let me work. And by putting pressure on my employer, by not letting him ship his goods, you are then intruding upon the rights of the states and the rights of the individuals. So effectively, because the real purpose of this law was not to actually regulate the shipment, it was to regulate the manufacturer, it ran afoul of the rule in EC Knight. Okay, now favor. Yeah, um, I guess that's why it's important to understand, like, like you set the stage at the beginning, the time period, because what I was thinking, like, with the lottery tickets, to me, it's, it seemed like they were trying to do the same thing that they're doing here, right. trying to get rid of, like, this moral evil or whatever that, like, mm -hmm. gambling is. So why would it succeed here? Um, it's like child labor seems like another like more evil, but it's because of the economy at the time and people needed jobs. And yeah, 19, 1918. Um, so effectively what Justice Day says is that you're not actually trying to regulate the shipment. 
what you're at, or, or really, these words, what you're really trying to do is standardize labor conditions, right? And they cannot control the states in the exercise of the police power over local trade, right? All they said was this was not your true aim. You'll see this a lot in court cases where the court says, you're telling us you're doing this for reason X, you're full of crap, it's really reason Y. And reason Y is not permissible, therefore the court will declare that action unconstitutional. So as a result, the, the child labor tax case, uh, sorry, the child labor law is unconstitutional. There's another case I don't assign, but I'll mention it briefly, called, called the child uh, labor tax case. Um, the child labor tax case. So Congress tried something else. Congress put a tax on goods manufactured with child labor. They tried another way. In other words, they said if you make any good with uh, any 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 item manufactured with child labor, you can do it with tax at a very high rate. And we said that Congress can tax local goods, right? Remember in the in the, in the oil case, the court said that was unconstitutional. They said the real reason you're putting this tax is not to raise revenue but to, again, to regulate local labor conditions. So again, in this era, the 1920s, the court was very uh, skeptical when the government said we're doing it for reason A, in fact, they were doing it for reason B. Now, here's the upshot. Knight and Hammer are no longer good law. They were both overruled following the New Deal. The Supreme Court would rule that the, that the commerce power was not limited by the state's police power. The court would vastly expand the scope of implied powers. And I'll, I'll just I'll fast forward to the next scene, and you see how far it goes. So Knight and Hammer are no longer good law, um, and Champion v. Ames is good law. In that case, is still cited for the proposition that Congress can prohibit, not regulate, but prohibit interstate commerce. Okay. Questions? Well, I have a question. Uh, Please. Preceded by a comment. I kind of, my, my 1L dreams were shattered. Oh, no. Did I shatter them? No, it was, it was. Who did uh, it? Justice Holmes. Oh, God. I hate him. No, I'm just kidding. Towards, you know, the Which? Great Mr. Public Policy, you know, he was all about, you know, just compensation as a matter of public policy uh. and the parties. And then I was quite surprised to see that viewpoint in the dissent on this case. Mm -hmm. um, is it going to be a consistent theme that when it comes to constitutional issues, he's a little bit less, um, I, I guess, by the black letter law when it comes to states' rights? Justice Holmes. Um, <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with him. Um, you, you'll see my uh, dislike of him come out much more later in the semester in a couple cases we do. Um, but Holmes is a, he's a giant. Uh, I think he's overrated by a, high, by a lot. I don't think he's that good. I, 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 in other words, his reputation's here. I think he should be like here. So I, I think he's very important, but he's not nearly as important as his reputation is. Um, but Justice Holmes was very much in con law uh, about deferring to the democratic process. Uh, if Congress determines that this law is reasonable, then Justice Holmes would be very hesitant to second guess the determinations of Congress. And for Justice Holmes, he says if Congress decides it's reasonable to prohibit child labor or shipping, then the court should not intervene to second guess that. That's Holmes's essence of life, is, is to defer to the democratic process. That, that's, what he, that's what he's obsessed with at every juncture, which is one of the reasons why he's so popular, because he's this model of a judge who doesn't impose his own policy preferences. He's just going for the democratic processes. Uh, and he did it fairly consistently with a few exceptions, but he was pretty consistent on that front. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately that, that's, where, uh, that's where Holmes is. But we'll, we'll do quite a lot of Holmes. I'm sorry he crushed your dreams. Yeah. Justice Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes. We'll, we'll do a lot of Holmes. He, 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 the reason why he's so significant is he wrote so many important opinions. Uh, in a lot of different topics. He was, he was a brilliant judge, for sure. Uh, but his comma stuff drives me nuts. OK. What else? Questions?
All right, let me give you a little preview for tomorrow. Actually, not tomorrow. I guess up on Monday. We're done for the week. Um, in class on uh, uh, Monday, we're going to be doing the New Deal Court and the Warren Court. And I'll just take a step back and give you some background. Um, the 1930s were a very um, tumultuous time in the world. Uh, the United States had just finished the, uh, or gotten out of the Great Depression, more or less. Um, war was brewing on the European continent. And things were changing very quickly. And during this time, progressive laws at both the state and the federal level were pushing new boundaries of what government could do. We'll focus on Congress here. Um, during the so-called New Deal, this was Ro Franklin Roosevelt, his platform was called the New Deal. Um, during the so-called New Deal, uh, President Roosevelt enacted uh, a lot of reforms about regulating local activity at the federal level. So we have the first Schechter Poultry versus the United States. Here, the federal government tried to regulate um, how poultry, how butchers run their shops in Brooklyn. Um, the second case, NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel, they tried to regulate labor conditions. And the third case, United States versus Darby, they were also regulating labor conditions local. And where could be Filburn, the court tried, or sorry, Congress tried to regulate locally grown wheat. Each of these cases pushed the boundary further and further of how much Congress can regulate, and those actions pushed aside the states regulating to the contrary. So, for example, if the states want to allow children to work and Congress says no, then Congress wins by virtue of the Supremacy Clause. And during this time, the court initially had a little bit of conservative resistance that they, they said no to the Roosevelt administration. But after a few more progressive justices were appointed, the court shifted and began to uphold uh, more of Roosevelt's agenda. Um, and that will bring us to the 1936-37 period, which is very important. Uh, the second half of the readings are a lot simpler. Uh, these are cases decided during the Warren Court. Um, federal civil rights laws, laws governing discrimination in employment and in place of public accommodation, are premised on the Commerce Clause and Necessary and Proper Clause. That is, the ability of Congress to tell a restaurant not to discriminate on race is because the business, the restaurant, is engaging in some sort of activity that affects interstate commerce. We'll see how you go from, uh, you know, saying that child labor laws are unconstitutional and hammer to, in the New Deal court, and the Warren court, uh, expanding further and further as Congress even regulates restaurants and hotels in a given state. All right, any questions? Okay. I'll see you all have a good weekend. Thank you.